So I, right? I think we need to go anyway. on, but um, I, I, I'm, we, we're scheduled to have what's called, what we called an LC pause, um, and I think it will be obvious that the few remarks that I want to make uh, underscore the re relevance of this conversation because uh, I think this, this, there are rules of the road that are going to have to be determined and they have to be informed by science but also by uh, considerations of policy. Um, so let me just start by saying we actually are acquiring a growing body of empiric data about what participants think and what participants want around the issue of genomic data and around the issue of sharing of genomic data. And I think there are some very, uh, very consistent messages emerging. Uh, participants in research, by definition, people who have agreed to be part of the research process, are strong supporters of research in general. They want research to be pursued, and they want it to be directed toward benefit. And when you probe, and I think we're, our data are more limited on this point, but when you probe, it's pretty clear that there's a strong endorsement of societal benefit. <clears throat> and what I would say is a buying of the message of NIH, that is, a buying of the idea that biomedical research leads to health benefit. Um, so participants want to see that health benefit. They're very supportive of that. They value information about how their samples are used, and that is separable from their interest in the research being pursued to generate benefit. They're interested in knowing how their samples are used. We've certainly heard from participants a great deal of pride in, in learning about how their research is, uh, how their par uh, samples uh, help research move forward. Interestingly, also, I think in our studies and other studies, uh, there seems to be a consistent expectation uh, that research participants will be told when there are research results that are relevant to them and that can provide personal benefit. And here we see that among research participants, there is perhaps an unrealistic expectation and an expectation that gets more unrealistic the more we build the kind of data resources that we're talking about at this meeting, which I think has implications for how we talk to uh, participants and what kinds of promises and what kinds of transparency we provide. Um, <clears throat> I will say it's an untested issue when you look at bullet two and bullet three here, to what extent participants might be very satisfied with more information about aggregate results of research, because that isn't very often fed back to participants in venues or language that is uh, accessible to them and uh, probably is something that we need to think more seriously about. I'm also including in parentheses here, uh, certainly for the U.S., it's important to acknowledge that there are substantial numbers of people within our population who are quite mistrustful of research. We have data to suggest that's higher. Those numbers are higher in, in individuals from minority populations. We also see from the uh, uh, controversies around newborn screening that is certainly by no means exclusive to minority populations. They're simply a subset of individuals who are very mistrustful of research and, and we need to acknowledge that. I think it simply underscores our need to be uh, responsible in how we communicate with participants about the research process. I would propose as something we have to seriously think about as we think about the data resources here. Uh, at this meeting um, that there is a limited, what I would call a limited ethical reach to the global consent. Informed consent is intended to support autonomy. If you go back to the Belmont Report and see what we're trying to accomplish with informed consent, it's to allow the voluntary participation in a research process that the participant is informed about fully enough that the participant can determine the um, risks and benefits of the process. That's not what we're doing with global consent. And I, I think there are all sorts of reasons why, first of all, creating data repositories and sharing data produces research benefit. Um, I think there's logic to why we would use a global consent process. Um, but what I think that tells us is that we can't stop with an informed consent process. That's part of a responsible uh, research enterprise, but it's just the beginning. Um, participants do have an interest in prospective engagement. 
We have to acknowledge the return of results issue. As I've mentioned, there's an expectation that, of course, researchers are going to tell me stuff that's important to me. We have to be honest about when we can and when we can't. And I think we have to be very clear about why we can't. Uh, we have to be very comfortable with the idea that we may be creating research repositories uh, where it really isn't practical to expect individual return of results. Um, it, 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 the weighing of resources going into that process versus resourcing it going into research may not make sense, but we need to engage participants in the conversation about that. We need to also think about the fact that even in the global consent, uh, participants retain the, the, the right to withdraw from research. That's kind of a bedrock of uh, autonomy protections in the informed consent process. But to meaningfully withdraw from your sample from dbGaP or a central repository, you have to know what's going on. Uh, and so a meaningful withdrawal opportunity means that we need to think very carefully about how we inform participants about how their samples are being used. And in fact, that's something participants want us to inform them about. They want to understand the research process and they want to understand what outcomes are available. All of this, I think, leads in a broad way to a need to think about stewardship of data re resources as much as technical details as we talk about what would be involved in streamlining dbGaP access, central repository, or any, any of the other models that we're considering. I, I want to pause here and just give you a little snippet of data from one of the focus groups that we've done. This is in an urban HMO. Uh, a predominantly white, very well-educated population, very supportive of, of research, um, a source of data for the points that I've just been making. Um, but they're also quite mindful about um, realities in terms of data protection. Uh, so there was this little back and forth between two participants in a focus group uh, talking about, you know, you create a database and sooner or later there's uh, there's a computer that gets lost, um, um, somebody steals them, somebody hacks them, whatever, uh, and, uh, and this happens. We see this in the news. It was referred to earlier today, and the second speaker comes right in and says, however, having said that, we don't stop using banks. Um, I think the point here, and the reason why I'm, I'm showing you this particular quote, is that I think participants in research, by, by and large, are going to be realistic. I don't think we need to make unrealistic promises to them, but we need to make promises that are as accurate as we can make them. We need to figure out what we can promise and what we can't promise. And, and then to go back to a discussion from an earlier session, we need to make the case that participating research is a good thing and generates benefits. And so to the extent that there are trade-offs, there's a reason for those trade-offs. Um, and I would propose, and I just have three more slides, that there are three elements that are key. And we can think about what all the different uh, details under those are. One of them is governments. Um, we really have to af ask ourselves what model or models, there may not be a si single one, of governance are going to be widely accepted as reasonable and fair as we build these structures. And that means we have to think about who's at the table making decisions. Uh, what protections can we promise? Uh, how is decision-making authority uh, allocated? How are differences resolved? All of these issues are going to be on the table any time you have a governance and a structure. Uh, and, and we need to go into any kind of data repository structure thinking about these things. Transparency, I would argue, is a hugely important component and one that is largely lacking now in the interface between participants and uh, uh, genomic research processes. That means uh, transparency about what the governance procedures are, who makes the decisions. If somebody's going to be certified, who does it? Under what criteria? How does that happen? Exactly what are the procedures for data protection and what's our best estimate for what they provide? Uh, and then transparency about the research process. Where did the data come from? I think it's a reasonable surmise that a lot of the people whose data are in dbGaP don't know it. Um, it wouldn't necessarily find it easy to figure it out if they do. And I think over time, that's likely to be a problem for us. Um, 
uh, I think we need to make that information easy to find. I think how the data are used need to be very clear to people, uh, and what comes out of it. Most fundamentally, how can we um, back the argument that the creation of these data uh, resources, these data sharing opportunities do accelerate the process and get us quicker to the kinds of benefits that participants care about. I think we really have to figure out how to explain that uh, because lacking that uh, uh, sustaining participant interest long term may be a problem. And then finally accountability. This has come up already and I just want to underscore it. Things will go wrong. So what happens when they go wrong? And how do we know that they went wrong? Um, what are the criteria for certification and who's checking that, that those uh, criteria are really being met? I think we can guarantee that as we create a certification process, there will be people who submit fraudulent data seeking certification. So how do we set up a system that's not onerous but is reasonable? Um, how do we uh, keep track of whether data are used according to the rules that we've all agreed are fair and reasonable? Um, and most significantly, um, what kind of consequences are there for bad behavior? I think the, the point about, I know someone will go to jail if they do something wrong uh, with uh, the money in my bank uh, is relevant here. Uh, I, I think part of generating trust is making sure that the consequences are there. So that's uh, all that I have to say. I, I just want to say I think as, as I'm listening to the meeting and our discussion is going forward, I think these are issues that need to be out there and need to be part of our discussion as we resolve um, uh, scientific issues around the data sharing challenge. And I, I, Mike, I don't know how much time you want to take for discussion now. Yeah. David? So I guess, I mean, I think everything you said is, is very reasonable, but I guess the one thing that I'm puzzled by is when you, I think you're just, in, in terms of saying we need to explain to people why this would accelerate progress, I guess what you're saying is we need to disabuse them of the notion we must have created that by sequencing a genome, we could learn anything at all. Because in my view, sequencing a single genome, the only way we can learn anything is if someone previously sequenced a lot of genomes and found a pattern that there was, you know, mutations in BRCA1 and looked carefully at people who carried them and figured out what was going on. So, and for anything we don't already know about, it's, it's a comparative process. And I know some people may not agree with that, but I think they're wrong. So, yeah. you know, so in other words, how are we, like what you're saying, I think, is we have to disabuse them of a notion we must have created that somehow in the absence of comparative data we could interpret all this stuff. Because well, I can't imagine how else otherwise they wouldn't understand No, I, I, that, that I we think need this. I think there is some hype out there and I think there is some room for disabusing people of how simple and easy things might be. But I, I, I actually think the, that what is actually going to happen when we take 70,000 genomes or 700,000 genomes and what kind of data are going to be important in, in non-genomic as well as genomic data in making sense of that and actually slowly figuring out uh, you know, biomedical problems and what we might do about them. I, I think that process is largely very opaque to much of the general public. Sure. I think we have an extraordinary opportunity yeah. to explain that because we have an extraordinary yeah. opportunity to make progress. And, and it's going to take resources. You know, it's more than us having a press release about nifty papers. It's going to be probably gathering data about what kind of messaging really makes sense to people and what pieces of that process are most opaque and how we can explain them better. Debbie. I've resonated with that in a very different way. I, rather than it, it overselling, I think just telling people, uh, the people who consented to be a part of any of these studies that go in are extremely altruistic. Not knowing what was going to happen, they did it anyway. Even if you wrote down everything that could potentially happen to them, they did it anyway. So I think that actually just laying out all the positives that could potentially come from this, not promising, but why a resource like this is very beneficial also helps. And I think, I think calling for that is really very important. I agree that it's not to explain uh, things have been overpromised. It's how this resource can generate uh, new insights into human biology and science. And it's not necessarily going 
going to generate tons of new papers or tons of new insights. It'll be a gradual thing as the data increases. But these are the kinds of tangible things that we've seen. And you could make models for how we've seen this as genomic has proceeded and how we've learned more and more. And you could make that available on, on the site or something. Pearl. I mean, I think that's a great idea. I would expand it, though, and uh, try to avoid genetic exceptionalism uh, and really go all of research. Because unfortunately, what we're finding is people say, well, I said no to the genetic research. And then it's like, I said no to all research. Um, one thing we are exploring is research notification to do in a very celebratory manner. This is how, you know, these are the types of research we do, and congratulations. Um, and we're having a hell of a time getting it through our leadership. Because you're afraid everybody's going to opt out. It's just, it's been a fascinating, it's been a four year navigation. I think as uh, productive and creative as this whole enterprise has been with sequencing and the transition and development of technology over the years, what we've failed to do is uh, um, even come close to parallel that with an ability to converse and communicate with research participants, you know, and Pearl showed the language they're using now, and to think that this is what we're presenting to folks in a written form and expecting them to have any real concept of what this is, because this type of research in particular, I think, is mostly conceptual. You know, it's not like telling somebody you'll take a drug and you'll probably get sick and your hair will fall out. I mean, this is all very abstract sort of information, so I think there's real opportunities to try to think more creatively about how to communicate with animation and video and uh, uh, film, perhaps, uh, different technologies uh, that can be brought to bear in this domain to give people a much better idea of what we're talking about with this. Because I certainly agree with you. I think the whole notion of having ongoing communication with research participants isn't likely to be successful. So we have to upfront get their trust and allow them to say, yeah, I, I, this looks good to me. I trust you do what you think is best with this sample to promote science, uh, and then live up to that trust. Pearl, did you want to? One sentence. I think we also need to uh, focus this on uh, health care providers who can be some of our best teachers. Mm -hmm. Good point. Any other comments? Oh, sorry. Last comment. So I want to raise a question related back to your accountability slide you have up here right now. Someday there'll be a posting uh, by WikiLeaks of a big chunk of dbGaP somewhere on a BitTorrent site. What are we going to do then? And what will be the restrictions on people in the biomedical research community on using those data which they can now get for free and anyone else can get for free from that BitTorrent site? From that what site? Where they can download some data that someone stole from dbGaP and posted it in the same way WikiLeaks posted all the Department of State cables. So just, we, we already had a leak like that a couple of years ago with AOL's data. So, you know, all of AOL, AOL put up the uh, de-identified search queries of 650,000 consumers back in 2006 that was re-identified by a couple of New York Times journalists. Well, that wasn't really a leak. Um, well, no, it wasn't a leak. It was an explicit it's a disclosure. But you can still get that data set on torrent sites. And it's basically taboo. You cannot publish on that data set, and anybody who has tried to publish on that data set has basically been barred from the information retrieval research community. Well, I, I think that point, that speaks to two things. One is we have to be realistic. Uh, we have to be in conversation with the public about what we're doing and why we're doing it, and potentially what risks, and if we, um, think that there is a realistic possibility of a scenario like the one you described, we have to have consequences in place. Uh, I'm not trying to say any of that is simple, um, but I think the, the uh, alternative approach, which is to not think about it, not talk about it, and then have it be a big disaster uh, when it happens, it, it would be a big disaster for the research process. So I think that's why we have to be prospective about it. <laughs>